Okay, this is the first attempt at a let's, let's read video for my philosophy class. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, some ideas about how I read a paper and uh, how you might read it too. And I'll try to keep a log of all the links that I open in the process so that you can look at them too later. Okay, so this is the first reading. Musical proto-language, Darwin's theory of language evolution revisited. And we'll see, this is a post by Tecumseh Fitch. So let's look up him. And note Tecumseh Fitch, William Tecumseh Sherman Fitch, he's an evolutionary biologist and cognitive scientist. And one thing I learned recently is that he's named after his great grandfather, William Tecumseh Sherman. Okay, so this is by a cognitive scientist and it's on the occasion of Charles Darwin's 200th birthday. You can see this was in 2009, February 12th. Darwin was born February 12th, 1809 same day as Abraham Lincoln. Um, okay, the outline of this is that Fitch is going to give us some idea of what Charles Darwin's theory of language origin was, and then tell us his modification of it. And he's going to begin with the observation that Darwin in this, as in many other uh, areas, was well ahead of his time. And uh, uh, Fitch is going to argue though that there's some modification to Darwin's theory that's needed. Darwin's theory, as we will see, is that language originated from music, and Darwin thought that music originated from sexual selection, the ability of uh, animals of one sex to try to attract animals of the other sex, like peacock tails and the like. But Fitch is going to say, this can't quite be right, and instead he thinks the origin of music and then language from music is going to be from uh, the role of music in raising children. Okay, so here, let's begin. So, uh, Darwin's origin of species made little mention of human evolution. This initial avoidance of human evolution was no oversight, but rather a carefully calculated move. Darwin was well aware of the widespread resistance his theory would meet from scientists, clergymen, and the lay public, and mention of human evolution might have generated insuperable opposition. Uh, many of you might remember any of this from uh, lots of recent current events. Anyway, Darwin's many opponents quickly seized on the human mind and oops, and language in particular as a potent weapon in the battle against Darwin's new way of thinking. Alfred Wallace, whose independent discovery of the principle of natural selection, let's uh, look up him. He's an interesting person to know about. He actually independently came up with the idea of evolution at the same time as Charles Darwin and him publishing his paper is what prompted Darwin to finally publish this book he had been sitting on for decades. Uh, Alfred Wallace, whose independent discovery of the principle of natural selection spurred Darwin into finally publishing his long-developed outline of the theory in 1859, didn't help by arguing that natural selection was unable to explain the origins of the human mind. Although Wallace had reservations about all evolutionary approaches to the mind, human language provided the most powerful argument due to the respectable position of linguistics and philology in Victorian science. And we'll talk more about this in class later. Uh, but philology is the comparative study of uh, uh, older languages. Uh, let's look at that. Yes, it's the study of language in oral and uh, written sources, and it's been done throughout the past, but was very big in the 19th century. Darwin's most formidable foe on the linguistic front was Friedrich Max Müller, professor of linguistics at Oxford University, a very well-known and respected scholar. Max Müller. So here he was German born, but he was uh, working in Britain for most of his life. And he was one of the founders of the Western academic study of Indian studies and religious studies. Uh, so he's really interesting in the history of linguistics, but was opposing Darwin on the idea of evolution of the mind. So in his lectures on the science of language delivered at the Royal Institution of Great Britain in 1861 and rapidly published thereafter, Miller launched a full frontal attack on Darwin and Darwinism using his credentials in the science of language as a powerful bludgeon. Miller's position was uncomplicated. Language is the Rubicon which divides man from beast and no animal will ever cross it. The science of language will yet enable us to withstand the extreme theories of the Darwinians and to draw a hard and fast line between man and brute. For Miller, language was the key feature distinguishing humans from all animals. Miller's arguments were seen by many as convincing. His student Noiré dubbed him the Darwin of the mind and considered Miller to be the only equal, not to say superior, 
antagonist who has entered the arena against Darwin. Miller's arguments about the unbridgeable qualitative difference between human language and all forms of animal communication, combined with Wallace's opinions, provided arguments that Darwin by necessity took very seriously. You'll note in that quote that it seems that at the time, Darwin was already regarded as one of the major thinkers, even if people didn't like what he was saying. Thus, when Darwin finally breached the sub broached the subject of human evolution in 1871 in his second great book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, the need to provide a credible explanation of language evolution was a central concern. Darwin rose to the challenge. His musical proto-language model, which will be discussed later, represents a powerful marriage of comparative data, evolutionary insight, and a biological perspective on language. Darwin's view of language was ahead of its time, and his model and arguments remain surprisingly relevant to contemporary debates. He clearly adopted a multi-component view of language, one that recognized the necessity of several distinct mechanisms to produce the complex product that we now call language, rather than privileging any one factor as the single key to language in a monolithic sense. Among these several components, he presciently recognized the necessity for complex vocal learning and recognized that this biological capacity, while unusual among mammals, is shared with many birds. The importance of vocal learning has often been forgotten, but also frequently reaffirmed by later scholars. Darwin also adopted an empirical, data-driven approach to the problem at hand. In particular, Darwin exploited a wide comparative database, exploiting not just his knowledge of non-human primate behavior, but also insights from many other vertebrates. Finally, and most characteristically, he resisted any special pleading about human evolution. He intended his model of human evolution to fit within and remain consistent with a broader theory of evolution that applies to beetles, flowers, and birds. There's actually a quote that Darwin has about beetles that uh, he spent a lot of his life studying beetles and uh, said something like, if there is a creator, it seems that he was inordinately fond of beetles because there's something like 30,000 different species of beetles, as many as all vertebrates and many other animals combined. <laughs> Unlike Wallace, who remained a human exceptionalist to his death, Darwin aimed to uncover general principles like sele sexual selection and shifts of function to provide explanations of unusual or unique human traits. Let's look up sexual selection. So this page has a lot more about sexual selection, and you can see that the examples they're talking about are bird coloration. And one important thing to note is that in most bird species, the males are very bright and colorful, while the females are very drab and blend into the background. And uh, we see here peacocks trying to attract peahens. OK, Darwin aimed to uncover general principles like sexual selection and shifts of function to provide explanations of unusual or unique human traits. While gradualistic, his model does not assume any simple continuity of function between non-human primate calls and language, and he clearly recognized the uniqueness of language in our species. In many ways, then, Darwin's model of language evolution finds a natural place in the landscape of contemporary debate concerning language evolution, and it is surprising that his model has received relatively little detailed consideration in the modern literature. And here's a couple exceptions, including one by Fitch himself. In this essay, I aim to redress this neglect by considering Darwin's model of language evolution in detail. After discussing Darwin's main points and arguments, I will briefly review additional data supporting Darwin's model that has appeared since his death. I will also discuss the issue of meaning, about which Darwin had too little to say, but which can be resolved by the addition of a hypothesis due to Jesperson. And here, let's uh, look up Jesperson, and here it's Otto Jesperson in particular. It's a relevant person. My conclusion, that's Fitch's conclusion, is that suitably modified in light of contemporary understanding, Darwin's model of language evolution, based on a proto-language more musical than linguistic, provides one of the most convincing frameworks available for understanding language evolution. The timing of my writing on the 150th anniversary of the origin and the 200th of Darwin's birth is also appropriate for a revival of interest in Darwin's compelling and well-supported hypothesis. Okay, language as an instinct to learn. Chapter two of The Descent of Man, entitled Comparison of the Mental Powers of Man and the Lower Animals, is one of the most remarkable in the entire Darwinian corpus, noteworthy for its concision and its breadth of argument in considering the evolution of the human mind. 
The first half of the chapter lays the groundwork of modern research in comparative cognition, arguing that animals have emotions, attention, memory, as well as many other mental traits in common with humans. However, Darwin's opponents, notably Miller, had already seeded the point that animals have memory, experience, emotions, and so on. Language was the key issue, and one can imagine considerable anticipation of both pro- and anti-Darwinian readers as they turned to the section simply titled Language. In 10 densely argued pages, Darwin considers some theoretical preliminaries and then lays out his theory of language evolution. The first stage involved a general increase in intelligence and complex mental abilities, and the second involves a sexually selected attainment of the specific capacity for complex vocal control, singing. The third stage was the addition of meaning to the songs of the second stage, which was both driven by and in turn fueled further increases in intelligence. Theoretically, Darwin makes a number of important observations. First, he recognizes the crucial distinction between the language faculty, the biological capacity which enables humans to acquire languages, and particular languages like Latin or English. This is an important distinction that linguists talk about all the time, uh, the difference between language in general, the ability that humans have to speak languages, and particular languages. The former capacity, which Darwin refers to as an instinctive tendency to acquire an art, is shared by all members of the human species. Darwin neatly bypasses the unproductive nature-nurture debate that has consumed so much scholarly energy by observing that language is not a true instinct as every language has to be learned. It differs, however, from all ordinary arts, for man has an instinctive tendency to speak, as we see in the babble of our young children. As you might notice, uh, every human child that grows up with other people around eventually learns a language, whereas not every human child learns other skills like drawing or uh, building things or cooking. As ethologist Peter Marler has put it, and let's look up uh, ethology. Ethology is the scientific and objective study of animal behavior. So as uh, the ethologist Peter Marler has put it, language is not an instinct, but an instinct to learn, whose expression entails that both biological and environmental preconditions be fulfilled. It is this instinct to learn for which a biological evolutionary explanation must be sought, a thoroughly modern perspective. Second, although he, Darwin, was well aware of the peculiarities of the human vocal tract. Darwin argues that the human capacity for language must be sought in the brain rather than the peripheral vocal tract. He acknowledges, and here central means the stuff that's going on in the brain, peripheral means the stuff that's going on in the rest of the body. And uh, you can see more about that if you look up the nervous system and they discuss the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system. He acknowledges that articulate speech, by which he means vocalization, that is the production of uh, sound with your vocal cords, augmented by controlled movement of the lips and tongue, is peculiar to man. So Darwin acknowledges that articulate speech is unique to humans, but he denies that this mere power of articulation suffices to distinguish human language, for as everyone knows, parrots can talk. Instead, Darwin states it's not speech but humans' large power of connecting definite sounds with definite ideas that is definitive of language, and that this capacity obviously depends on the development of the mental faculties. By locating the language capacity in the human brain, Darwin's viewpoint is again thoroughly modern. Finally, Darwin recognized the relevance to human language evolution of birdsong, which he considered the nearest analogy to language. Like humans, birds have fully instinctive calls and an instinct to sing but the songs themselves are learned. This is an interesting thing to look up. Uh, if you go to different parts of the country, certain, there are certain birds that have the same song everywhere that they uh, exist. So that is their, their actual song is innate. But there are other birds where uh, they have regional dialects just as humans do. They have an innate capacity to learn bird song, but the birds in, of that species in any particular area learn the song that their parents sing and make slight modifications over time, which is how uh, the bird song ends up diverging. He recognized the parallel between infant babbling and songbird subsong. So babbling is the stage when infants are saying ma, 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 ba, 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 da, da, da. 
and he recognized the key fact that cultural transmission ensures the formation of regional dialects in both birdsong and speech. Finally, he recognizes that physiology is not enough for learned song. Crows have a syrinx as complex as a nightingale's, but use it only in unmusical croaking, whereas nightingales have famous songs. All of these parallels have been amply confirmed and further explored by modern researchers. Okay, so here's Darwin's musical proto-language hypothesis. Darwin's model of the phylogenesis of the language faculty, let's look that up on Wikipedia, phylogenesis. Phylogenesis is the biological process by which a taxon of any rank appears. And so the, if we look at these trees, it's how different branches of the tree of life end up differentiating themselves into mammals versus reptiles and within the mammals into primates versus rodents and within the primates to monkeys versus apes and so on. So Darwin's model of the phylogenesis of the language faculty, like most models today, posits that different aspects of language were acquired sequentially in a particular order and under the influence of distinguishable selection pressures. The hypothetical systems characterized by each addition can be termed, following these two authors, as proto-languages. Darwin's first hypothetical stage in the procession, from an ape-like ancestor to modern humans, was a greater development of proto-human cognition. The mental powers in some early progenitor of man must have been more highly developed than in any existing ape, before even the most imperfect form of speech could have come into use. He elsewhere suggests that both social and technological factors may have driven this increase in cognitive power. Next, Darwin outlines the crucial second step, what I have dubbed musical proto-language. And this is Fitch talking about himself again. Having noted multiple similarities with birdsong, Darwin argues that the evolution of a key aspect of spoken language, vocal imitation, was driven by sexual selection and used largely in producing true musical cadences, that is, in singing. He suggests that this musical proto-language would have been used in both courtship and territoriality as a challenge to rivals, as well as in the expression of emotions like love, jealousy, and triumph. Darwin concludes, from a widely spread analogy, amply documented with comparative data later in the book, that sexual selection played a crucial role driving this stage of language evolution, in particular suggesting that the capacity to imitate vocally evolved analogously in humans and songbirds. And here, uh, search analogy versus homology, and uh, this is something to note. Uh, this is a term in biology that bat wings and bird wings are considered to be analogous because they evolved at separate times into the idea of wings. And you can see they're different because they have their fingers in different places. However, they are homologous in another sense because they're both derived from the front fins of fish, just like the front legs of mammals and the arms of humans. Okay, so uh, where were we? Oh yes, the capacity to imitate vocally evolved analogously in humans and songbirds. So he's saying humans and songbirds don't share a capacity from their ancestors to learn vocals. They instead have both independently emerged, uh, evolved the ability to imitate voc vocally. The crucial remaining question is how emotionally expressive musical proto-language made the transition to true meaningful language. How, in Humboldt's words, humans became a singing creature, only associating thoughts with the tones. And here, if we look up von Humboldt, there's two people named von Humboldt, both of whom are quite interesting, but this is about Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was actually the designer of the modern university system, among other sorts of things, including linguistics. So this leap from non-propositional song to propositionally meaningful speech, and here linguists and philosophers talk about propositions as uh, well-formed sentences, things that mean something in particular. So this leap remains the greatest explanatory challenge for all musical proto-language theories. Darwin, citing the previous writings of Miller, so here's where Darwin's using his opponents against themselves. He's citing the writings of Miller and Farrer. He suggests that articulate language owes its origins to the imitation and modification aided by signs and gestures of various natural sounds the voices of other animals, and man's own instinctive cries. Darwin thus embraces all three of the major leading theories of word origins of his contemporaries. 
Once proto-humans had the capacity to imitate vocally and to combine such signals with meanings, virtually any source of word forms and meanings would suffice, including onomatopoeia, So this is where you make sounds that sound like something, things like tick-tock or ka-ching, ka-ching, and other languages have other sorts of things. So he says, virtually any source of word forms and meanings would suffice, including onomatopoeia, for perhaps an imitated roar for lion, or whoosh for wind, and controlled imitation of human emotional vocalizations, mock laughter for play or happiness. The attachment of specific and flexible meanings to vocalizations required only that some unusually wise ape-like animal should have thought of imitating the growl of a beast of prey, and this would have been a first step in the formation of a language. Darwin does not suggest that the evolutionary process would stop with the initial acquisition of meaning, for as the voice was used more and more, the vocal organs would have been strengthened and perfected. Additionally, language would have reacted on the mind by enabling and encouraging it to carry on long trains of thought, which can no more be carried on without the aid of words, whether spoken or silent, than a long calculation without the use of figures or algebra. Thus began the interactive evolutionary spiral that led to modern humans. The idea here is that uh, as you start developing little bits of language, that enables you to have longer thoughts. And as you start developing longer thoughts, you end up uh, getting the capacity to develop more complex language. And there's a feedback here. Just like if any of you have studied mathematics, then you start by learning basic arithmetic, then learn how to write it down. That ability to write it down enables you to multiply and divide much larger numbers than the ones you can do in your head. And once you've developed those skills, that helps you develop the basic skills of algebra. And writing that down then helps you develop more complex mathematical skills. And so, uh, here, the language and the thought play back and forth into each other, even though neither one is necessary for the other to get started, but having each one helps the other develop further. Okay, signaling modality, vocalization or gesture. So modality here means what means of communication is it? Is it sound or is it gestures? Darwin explicitly acknowledged the role of gesture in conveying meaning, echoing Condillac's earlier arguments. Let's look up Condillac. Uh, I think this is this person. He's a French philosopher and epistemologist. So Darwin acknowledged the role of gesture echoing Condillac and presaging contemporary discussions. However, Darwin was aware of the power of, of signed language. He reminds us that using his fingers, a person with practice can report to a deaf man every word of a speech rapidly delivered at a public meeting. Now that's interesting to see that uh, uh, even back then, there were already sign language interpreters at public meetings. He also acknowledged the value of gesture in conveying meaning and allowed that vocal communication would have been aided by signs and gestures. Nevertheless, he argues against gestural theorists, the people who think that gesture is the entire origin of language, because the pre-existence in all mammals of vocal organs constructed on the same general plan as ours, that is their mouth and throat and so on, would lead any further development of communication to target the vocal organs rather than the fingers. Darwin clearly believes that the power of speech is neural, not peripheral. So that is, it's in the central nervous system, not in the nerves around your tongue and lips and throat. He cites the early aphasia literature. And aphasia is the inability to comprehend or formulate language because of damage to specific brain regions. You may have heard of various famous cases where someone who has a particular brain injury loses the ability to speak grammatically, but still understands words. Someone else who's got a different brain region injured loses the ability to understand words, but still produces totally grammatical, meaningless babble. So Darwin cited the early aphasia literature as a demonstration of the intimate connection between the brain, as it is now developed in us, and the faculty of speech. Comparing the vocal organs and brain, he concludes that the development of the brain has no doubt been far more important than the development of the vocal organs. Although he uses a continuity argument to support the early and sustained role of speech, he firmly acknowledges the abrupt modern discontinuity in the linguistic system that has evolved. Thus, like many other insightful commentators, Darwin recognized that posing phylogenetic continuity 
and modern discontinuity as in any way opposed is to create a false dichotomy. The tree-like nature of phylogeny guarantees that both are core parts of the evolutionary process. That is, if you look at modern bats, bats are completely unlike any other mammal with their wings. But if you go through the history, you'll find that bats developed from other mammals that are much like rats or monkeys and only gradually developed into the things that are now totally discontinuous from other mammals. And that's what Darwin is saying about language. Even though language is now completely unlike anything that other animals have, in the, its historical development, it would have emerged from something continuous with what other apes have. Okay, Darwin Redux, modern comparative data. Summarizing, Darwin suggested that the first step on the road to human language was a general increase in intelligence in the hominid lineage. In a typically pluralistic fashion, that is uh, including multiple different uh, theories and uh, activities in the process, he recognized both social intelligence, Machiavellian intelligence in the modern trope, and technological ecological intelligence, e.g. for tool use, as playing important selective roles. That is, in early human development, there's two types of intelligence that are needed. One is to how to understand the environment, and the other is how to understand and deal with the other humans that are in your environment. Given our modern understanding of hominid evolution, this first stage might be provisionally linked to the genus Australopithecus or perhaps early Homo. And uh, so here's the Wikipedia article on hominids, and it has a, a discussion of many different genuses within this family. The second stage is the least intuitive, that before vocalizations were used meaningfully, they were used, so to speak, aesthetically to fulfill many of the same functions that modern humans use music today. Courtship, bonding, territorial advertisement and defense, competitive displays, etc. Just think about all the occasions for which people have songs. People sing to someone that they're uh, interested in. People sing together as a group to bond. People sing before and after sporting events to advertise their territory and engage in competitive displays. This idea that complex vocalization and thus some aspects of phonology and syntax, phonology and syntax we'll talk more about in class, these might have preceded the ability of speech to convey propositions and distinct meanings. Uh, so this idea that complex vocalizations might have preceded the ability of speech to convey meanings is the most challenging aspect of Darwin's model. That is, he's, he's saying that all the other aspects of language evolved first and meaning evolved last. But Darwin uses the comparative database and particularly detailed analogy between learned bird song and human song and speech to show that this step is not just plausible, but well documented. It has occurred in many other species. Indeed, modern data shows that vocal learning without propositional meaning has evolved independently in at least three other clades of mammals, cetaceans, pinnipeds, and bats. Cetaceans are whales, pinnipeds are seals, bats are of course bats, and three separate clades of birds, parrots, hummingbirds, and the Oskian songbirds. So again, the, it's not that all birds have song, it's that three separate families of birds independently developed song. And similarly, not all mammals have learned vocal uh, uh, communication, but whales, seals, bats, and humans do. Such convergent evolution or repeated independent evolutionary developments of a comparable ability provides our strongest empirical basis for estimating the likelihood of a particular type of evolutionary event. That is, if flying is something that emerges multiple times in uh, uh, animal evolution, then it's quite plausible that flying could easily emerge. Whereas if uh, something else uh, has only emerged once, then it seems like it must be a hard thing to evolve. And what he's saying is their vocal learning seems to be a relatively easy thing to evolve since at least six different groups of vertebrates have evolved it. Many of the chapters in this book affirm and extend the observations of parallels between language learning and birdsong that Darwin offered in 1871. Thus, whether intuitive or not, Darwin's focus on and hypothesis for the evolution of vocal learning is consistent with a wealth of evolutionary and comparative data. Difficulties with Darwin's model. Evolving phrasal semantics. How did man become, as Humboldt somewhere defined him, a singing creature only associating thoughts with the tones. Otto Jesperson. 
Despite its many virtues, there remain some important problems with Darwin's model that have impeded its acceptance today. The first and most important is his explanation of the addition of meaning. Darwin's explanation, as typical for his day, was concerned only with word meanings, what today would be termed lexical semantics. But from the viewpoint of modern linguistics, his model seems wholly inadequate to deal with large swaths of semantics, particularly those aspects tied in with the interpretation of whole phrases and sentences, phrasal semantics. Modern formal semantics has developed rigorous models of this aspect of linguistic meaning, which we'll talk about quite a bit over the course of the semester, and it's far more complex and difficult to explain than lexical semantics. Although one can hardly blame Darwin for not foreseeing these relatively recent developments in linguistics, they nonetheless raise substantial difficulties for his model. For much of the syntactic glue which binds sentences together into large, meaningful holes, function words, inflection, bound morphemes, word order, and a host of others. Uh, these cannot be understood as resulting from onomatopoeia or imitation of emotional expressions. For instance, why does the ed ending mean past? Why does and mean linking two sentences together? There is no sound that has a meaning of the past. There's no sound that has the meaning of linking things together. Nor can these things be readily understood as inventions of some uniquely intelligent individual. All evidence suggests that these indispensable linguistic tools develop reliably in individuals of normal intelligence. This key aspect of language thus seems to have a biological basis. Darwin does recognize the phenomenon today called grammaticalization. And this is a process of language change by which words become grammatical markers. So think about the way that the word not becomes this negation marker int in words like isn't and doesn't. And in other languages, that's happened quite a bit. So Darwin does recognize this phenomenon of grammaticalization. He states that conjugations, declensions, etc., originally extent, existed as distinct words since joined together. But he offers no model for the origin of these distinct words. And it's hard to see how onomatopoeia or similar processes could have generated this original syntactic and semantic glue. Thus, complex phrasal semantics remains unexplained by Darwin's model. However, this oversight was remedied long ago by the linguist Otto Jespersen. Jespersen's basic insight involves recognizing the link in humans between musical and linguistic phrases and working conceptually backward from there. That is, phrases. Remember that in language we have phrases, but in music there are also phrases, like uh, a whole line of a song or a whole uh, musical thought. Jespersen suggested a form of proto-language in which initially whole propositional meanings attached to entire sung phrases, but there was no consistent link between the individual conceptual components of the meaning and the component parts of the musical phrases, syllables and notes. So that is, there might have been a song that means, this is the land where I live and you shouldn't come here. And there's another song that means, aren't you a nice baby? Why don't you go to sleep right now? But the individual parts of the song didn't have any meaning. Thus, there were no words as we now understand them. From this holistic starting point, Jespersen argued that a cognitive process of analysis, breaking down, started, which slowly isolated individual chunks of the musical phrase, syllables or multisyllabic phraselets, what today we call words, and associated them with individual components of the meaning, e.g. nouns, verbs, and adjectives, whose precursors were already present in the conceptual systems of our pre-linguistic ancestors. So that is the idea is that if there's a song that means this is my land and you should stay away, and there's another song that means uh, this is my land and we should share it, maybe there's a part that those two songs have in common, and then people start using that part with other things to create new meanings. And that's how meanings attached to whole songs can become parts of meanings attached to parts of songs, which eventually become little chunks of meaning attached to words. Jespersen's hypothesis of a holistic proto-language has recently been rediscovered and championed by linguist Alison Ray and neuroscientist Michael R. Beeb. Both cite considerable addition, additional evidence supporting this analytic model, including data from modern adult language, child language acquisition, and cognitive neuroscience. Supporters of the more intuitive synthetic, that is putting together model language of proto-language, in which words evolved first, followed by syntactic operations for combining them, 
for example, Bickerton, they have subjected holistic models to extensive criticisms. However, I, Fitch, argue that most of these critiques miss their mark if the notion of a musical proto-language is accepted as a starting point. That is, if we think that language started with song, then these criticisms don't get in the way. Jesperson and Ray's model of holistic proto-language thus dovetails nicely with the musical proto-language hypothesis in ways that I believe resolve many, if not all, of these criticisms. Sexual selection. A second problem with Darwin's model remains unresolved at present. His focus on sexual selection is the force driving the evolution of musical proto-language. Appearing as it did as just a few pages of an extensive tome, introducing and then extensively documenting the very idea of sexual selection, this aspect of Darwin's theory has the virtue of explaining a core aspect of human evolution using a broad principle abundantly demonstrated in the evolution of other species. Just as throughout the rest of his work, Darwin eschewed special pleading for our own species. That is, he wanted to say, humans work just like any other animal. The central difficulty for this beautiful hypothesis is posed by two ugly facts about modern human language. You may not think these facts are that ugly. It's equally developed in males and females, and it's expressed very early in ontogeny, essentially at birth. Ontogeny is the growth of an individual organism as opposed to phylogeny, which is the development of a species over time. These aspects of language differentiate it sharply from most sexually selected traits, which are strongly biased to develop in the more competitive sex, typically males, and only at sexual maturity. That is, if you look at birds, male birds have all the bright colors, female birds are drab. Young male birds don't have that bright coloration. Since bright coloration is sexually selected, it appears only in adult males and not in children or females. Similarly with bird song. However, with humans, that's not how language works. All humans have language, even very young ones, humans of all sexes, not just males. And then as Fitch says, if anything, human females have superior language skills when compared to men. Although clearly the difference is very minor, if at all. And language is remarkable in its very early development, with at least some early tuning to phonology already occurring in utero before birth. These are some interesting studies. I'm not sure how much I believe what's in them, but you could look them up if you want. There are several potential answers to the difficulty that these facts pose. One is to argue that during the musical proto-language stage, sexual selection was the driving force, and song was, at that time, just as in most bird species, expressed mainly in males at sexual maturity. Then, at a later stage, presumably during the evolution of meaningful language, some other selective force kicked in so that language became equally or better expressed in females and was pushed to develop early. A candidate selective force is kin communication, that selection for information transmission between parents and their offspring, or more generally between adults and their younger kin. I've suggested that kin selection drove the second stage of the evolution of propositional semantic content. And let us look up kin selection. And so this is how things like bees evolve. Individual bees don't reproduce, but they help their relatives reproduce. And that's why they're so evolutionarily successful. So Fitch has suggested that kin selection drove the second stage of the evolution of propositional semantic content. For an exploration and critique of this idea, see Zavitsky. This kin selection scenario neatly explains the early ontogenetic appearance of language in infants. The earlier offspring begin absorbing their elders' knowledge, the better, and its bias toward females, who are the primary caregivers in all hominoids. So that is, in chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, as well as humans, females uh, do a lot more of the childcare. The continued presence of meaningful speech in males is easily explained by the dual fact that immature males must also learn, and that unusually in humans, so that is, humans are unusual compared to other apes, Adult males play an important role in child rearing. Whether it's the father or male siblings of the mother is irrelevant to this fact. And that's an interesting thing to note, although in the societies that we might be familiar with, mothers and fathers tend to raise children together. In many other societies, it's not uncommon for fathers to just show up once to create the baby for the woman, but then she lives with her family and her brothers help her raise the child. So that there are both male and female adults raising the child, just not the father. 
Finally, this kin selection model has the virtue of explaining why language evolved in humans and not in other musical lineages. Humans combine an extended childhood with ample time to acquire knowledge with very small reproductive output. The fact that ape babies are born singly and rarely conspire to make the survival of each individual hominid infant a crucial component of reproductive success in the great ape lineage. That is, apes and humans tend to have one baby at a time with twins as a rare thing and tend to have only one baby per year or every couple of years, as opposed to many other animals like dogs and rabbits, which easily have six or eight babies at a time and easily have babies every few months. An alternative possibility is that sexual selection was and remains an important driving force in human cognitive evolution, including language, but that human pair bonding has changed the rules in significant ways so that both sexes are choosy and both are competing for high quality mates. That is, the reason that birds have color only in one sex is because females are choosy, so males have to advertise themselves well. But if human females and males are both equally choosy, then both sexes would have to compete. Some comparative data can be cited in support of the second option. Recent data shows that female bird song is not as uncommon as thought by Darwin, who considered female bird song to be a simple aberration. There is some evidence suggesting that sexual selection can indeed drive female bird song, though it seems clear that female song is a secondary derivation of male song in most lineages. While these observations provide some support for the idea that the dual sex expression of human language could result from sexual selection, it's important to recognize that female song still appears to be numerically speaking exceptional and that any model based on sexual selection will have difficulty explaining the extremely early development and productive use of language in human infants. And by productive here, linguists tend to mean uh, human children, as soon as they learn language, they don't just repeat sentences that other people have said, they very quickly learn to produce their own sentences and say things that adults never would have come up with. <laughs> a final possibility is that sexual selection never played a role in the evolution of music or of language. The popular notion that music evolved for courtship stands on surprisingly weak empirical footing compared to a less obvious but better documented function of music, mother to infant communication. Mothers sing to their infants all over the world, even those who claim to be unable to sing and infants both prefer song to speech and respond to song in manifestly adaptive ways, e.g. engaging with and getting excited by play songs and being lulled to sleep by lullabies. These observations suggest that music originally functioned in a childcare context as it continues to do today. By this model, the use of music in bonding among adults is simply a side effect of this central function, and its occasional use in courtship is a red herring. This final possibility is clearly compatible with the kin selection arguments advanced above, but here there would be no intervening stage of language evolution in which sexual selection ever played a dominating role. Even Darwin was occasionally wrong. Terminological niceties, musical or prosodic proto language. A final, less crucial difficulty with Darwin's model is terminological. Darwin himself seemed to conceive of his pre-semantic proto-language in terms directly comparable to modern day music, or at least he provides no indication that this is not the case. He concludes that musical notes and rhythm were present in this proto-language and that they were deployed in producing true musical cadence, cadences, that is in singing. This is why I term his model musical proto-language. However, modern human music consists not just of song, but also instrumental music. So this appellation of musical proto-language might immediately have connotations of drumming, whistling, or flutes that are not, strictly speaking, relevant to human language evolution. I think there are a few communities that use whistling or drums as a sort of code language, but it's not common in human language. More pertinently, if we take the musical proto-language model seriously, we must not acknowledge that modern music may not necessarily preserve the state of this proto-language precisely, and that both music and language have changed in the interim. That is, Darwin's hypothetical communication system was proto-music, not music per se. And here, something you might note is that if you look at what are the oldest forms of music that still exist, they tend to be things like chant, uh, which is very different from modern songs. Uh, chant tends not to have 
precise rhythms and precise things like that. In many ways, it is much more like speaking. Adopting the logic of comparative reconstruction, which we might talk about more later when we talk about historical linguistics, we can then ask which aspects of modern speech and of song are shared and thereby reconstruct this system. The central shared aspects are prosodic and phonological. The use, the, and prosody is the sort of uh, uh, aspects of language phrases. That is, in English, you can tell whether someone's asking a question based on how the angle of their pitch goes up and down. Um, and that's very different from understanding the individual words that are being said. Uh, so the central shared aspects are prosodic and phonological. The use of a set of primitives, syllables, to produce larger hierarchically structured units, phrases, which are discreetly distinctive. But two key musical aspects are not shared between speech and song, namely discrete pitched notes. That is, there's a difference between singing do, re, mi, and you don't use the pitches in between, and temporal isochrony, a steady beat. That is, in modern songs, uh, there are some notes that are a full beat, some notes that are a half a beat, but you don't have notes that are all sorts of odd fractions. I've used this comparison of modern speech and song to argue for a subtly different model from that of Darwin, which I termed prosodic rather than musical proto-language, in which proto-language consisted of sung syllables, but not of notes that could be arranged in a scale, nor produced with a steady rhythm. This prosodic proto-language model thus includes the sung cadence aspect of Darwin's model, while rejecting both his notes and rhythm, at least as normally construed. Both of these aspects of most modern song are, by hypothesis, more recent developments in music not present in proto-language. I see this as an adjustment of Darwin's hypothesis fully in keeping with its spirit. Furthermore, it's unclear from his writings whether Darwin would have disagreed with this adjustment. A different reconstruction of the common ancestor of music and language involving both discrete pitches and isochronic rhythm, as well as tone-based meaning, is given in Brown. Brown also argues that his hypothetical proto-language, which he dubs musolanguage, could not have evolved by normal neo-Darwinian selection and thus demands a group selection explanation. This remains its clearest and most dubious distinction from what is otherwise just a rediscovery of Darwin's basic hypothesis. Conclusions. I have argued that Darwin's model for language evolution, musical proto-language, suitably updated, provides a compelling fit to both the phenomenology of modern music and language and to a wealth of comparative data. By placing vocal control at the center of his model, Darwin availed himself of the rich comparative database of other species who have independently evolved complex vocal imitation. And he thus explains two of the features of human language that set it off most sharply from non-human primate communication. Uh, vocal learning and cultural transmission. That is, if you look at other primates, they don't have anything like bird song or whale song. It's birds, whales, bats, humans that have this sort of thing. The biggest missing piece in Darwin's model, as I see it, is a reasonable explanation of phrasal semantics and the aspects of syntax that go with it. But this gap was filled by Jesperson. So that is, Jesperson gives the idea that you start with phrases having meaning and then break it down into words rather than Darwin's idea, which was starting with words and trying to build them up. Together, these hypotheses provide one of the leading models of language evolution available today. For an enthusiastic book-length exploration, see Mithen, one that has been repeatedly rediscovered by later scholars. While many aspects of what has now become a family of models remain to be explored empirically, the issues surrounding sexual, kin, and group selection remain particularly unclear, this is a model worthy of detailed consideration and elaboration today. Most importantly, Darwin's model makes numerous testable empirical predictions, for example, about the partially overlapping nature of the brain mechanisms underlying music and spoken language and their genetic basis that can be answered in the coming decades. This year of Charles Darwin's 200th birthday, that is 2009, remains an opportune time for Darwin's own model of language evolution to regain the prominence it deserves. Okay, so he's got several arguments in here. A lot of this is devoted to explaining Darwin's theory, and then the arguments are focused on why is Darwin's theory better than competitors? Why are certain aspects of Darwin's theory uh, perhaps misleading or underdeveloped? And why does some contemporary alternative do better? Hopefully, seeing how I go through this reading will help you see 
how you could go through this reading and other readings. And I'll try to post a link of all of the uh, uh, links that I've uh, gone to in reading this in the comments below or in the description below. Okay, thanks.